Hello everyone, I'm Alan Joaquin and I'm with the Sons of History and welcome to tonight's edition of Tuesday Night History Live. Uh, we are going to be discussing yet again another controversial subject. Uh, this one will be the Second Amendment. Uh, before we begin, again, a uh, couple things I want to uh, dedicate this to my friend uh, Marlene Devia in New Jersey who's uh, on a, in a respirator. Uh, she runs the Turn page for AMC Turn. Um, Marlene, I hope you get well. I hope you're watching, and uh, you know we need you back. So, um, and as usual, before we begin, um, grab your drink. So, today I decided I'm going to have Johnny Walker Black neat. I just uh, felt like it. So, you know, grab your drink, and let's talk about the Second Amendment. Because believe me, we have quite a bit to talk about. So. Ah, man, good stuff. Anyway, all right, so Second Amendment. Now, we all know what the Second Amendment is. Um, it, it is in the Bill of Rights, but what we're going to do is uh, we'll read it to you so that you will know um, what, what the big controversy is. Apparently, there's a lot of controversy because of the wording. And we're going to talk about that because some people are saying, what's the intent? So... Instead of listening to what today's politicians and some of the lawyers that are in favor of removing the Second Amendment or even amending the Second Amendment, um, we are going to tackle what was the intent in terms of the Founding Fathers. And that is going to include where they got their education from, who they listened to, um, who they were emulating, who they admired, and and their writings. So, I mean, they, they did write quite a bit about how they felt about inalienable rights, natural rights. You know, in the last couple of episodes of Tuesday Night History, we discussed uh, the difference between rights that are naturally yours and something that the government could give you. Natural and inalienable rights are things that the government cannot take away because they never gave it to you. Uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, government has absolutely no place in dictating your life, your liberty, or your pursuit of happiness. It is a natural right. It's a God-given right. It's an inalienable right. And part of, that, part of those rights is um, defending yourself. Um, which is where the Second Amendment comes in. And the reason why we consider them inalienable rights and not privileges given to us by the government is because, again, what the government giveth, the government can take it away. But if it, was, if it was never theirs to begin with, they cannot take it away from you. And that's where you have to fight. And this is where the Founding Fathers come in. Now, the Second Amendment to the Bill of Rights states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, a lot of people, a lot of politicians, most of them, if not all of them on the left, feel that, that this amendment is a collective right, that it's supposed to be involved only with the militia that, that the framers, the founding farmers, founding Far, bleh, okay, the founding fathers, what they intended was that in order to keep and bear arms, you had to be in the militia, which they now call the National Guard. The reason why they're wrong is because you, we have plenty of evidence, f the words of the, of, the, of the founding fathers themselves state otherwise. And this is why I stated that we are going to talk about the intent of the framers rather than today's politicians and their lawyers doing their bidding. So, and you know, look, I like lawyers. A lot of them are good, you know, so if you're a lawyer, please don't be offended. Okay, so now, um, here's what we are going to discuss in terms of the Founding Fathers. Today's politicians who do not like the Second Amendment they want to dissect every word that's in the Second Amendment. 
they're not interested, at least from what I have seen, they, they're not interested in the intent based on the, based on the framers and what, what inspired them and what influenced them. So this is where we have to go back and take a look at what uh, the framers looked at, who they read, and that will give you a better idea because then it leads into their writings, it leads into the things that they said, which then led to the Bill of Rights. All right, now, the Founding Fathers, uh, they, now they had received a classical education. Uh, they were also, they, they all pretty much uh, went to church. Now, they may not have ended up as, as Christians. They may have been deists. They may have been in between, you know, like, uh, you know, John Adams. Uh, he would be termed today as a Unitarian. Um, Sam Adams was a Christian, uh, as was John Jay, who, who was one of the uh, men who wrote the uh, Federalist Papers, which is a book that I do recommend. If you really want to know what the Founding Fathers intended, read the Federalist Papers. John Jay, Christian. Um, and then everybody else was kind of in between the deism and the Christianity. They all, they all fell in between. They all went, like George Washington went to church every Sunday. Now, he didn't take communion, but he went to church. But the people who inspired these founding fathers, the works that they've read, discussed natural rights. They discussed the right of self-defense. They discussed also the dangers of a standing army in peacetime. All of that was, was important because of the kings who turned into tyrants. Kings would disarm the people. And, you know, like the emperor of Rome would have the Praetorian Guard. Um, a, lot of, a lot of these kings and, and princes and dukes who, you know, ran their principalities and their duchies and their kingdoms would, would use their power, would use a standing army to, to destroy a republic. Caesar destroyed the republic. Now, you know, Rome was a republic until Julius Caesar um, came into power. And then the whole thing with, uh, with Augustus, he had the Civil War. But one person that you really want to read about is a gentleman, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. His name is uh, Caesar Becharia. Now, I have his name listed in the Sons of History. Caesar Becharia. Uh, wrote about natural rights. Very important. Thomas Jefferson was heavily influenced by this guy. Uh, Bacharia was in favor of, of the people being armed. It was, for him, it was a natural right. And it wasn't just him. You know, there, there are other discussions, not only, like I said, not only about, about the people being armed for, their, for the defense of the state, for the defense of their homes, for the defense of their families, themselves, all of that was interwoven. There was also the fear that, you know, because of the king having a standing army, that the king would use the army against the people. So these are the ones that addressed this. And I advise that you read their works so that you'll kind of get an idea of, 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 of how the founding fathers were influenced. Okay, so, so I mentioned Cesar Becharia. Then there's uh, uh, Niccolo uh, Machiavelli. He wrote The Prince. You know, The Prince, uh, one of the things that he talked about that had an impact on the Founding Fathers was, um, you know, that's where the ends justifies the means. But, but what they were looking at was how you don't, wanna, you don't want to recruit mercenaries. That's an, you, you never want to recruit mercenaries. Now, Yes, there have been mercenaries that have been used in places like Africa. And, you know, in my opinion, I think, you know, like in the Katanga and the Congo, that they were used for some good. But to keep and prop up a government, no. Machiavelli was not in favor of that at all. And, and George Washington and, and many others mentioned the um, having mercenaries to protect the king. That was a threat. You wanted the people. If the people are armed and the people love the king, they love the ruler, then you have no chance of being overthrown. If you're a just king, if you're a just prince, and you were a moral, good leader, and the people were armed, you trusted the people with arms, you had no chance of being overthrown, especially if a country invaded you, because overwhelmingly the people were more likely to fight to the death to protect their good leader than if they were conscripted 
and their king was, was a tyrant. So Machiavelli, uh, John Locke, who wrote, you know, he's, you know, the English Bill of Rights. When you think of the English Bill of Rights, you think of John Locke, very influential. And in the English Bill of Rights, uh, which King Mary and, I'm sorry, uh, King William and Queen Mary, they had to sign and approve of in order to become king and queen after the glorious revolution of 1688. Um, the English Bill of Rights talks about the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It's in there. Take a look, you will see it. Okay, uh, moving on, let's see. We have uh, uh, Rousseau, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Hugo uh, Grotius, uh, Sir Edward Coke, Montesquieu, Thomas Hobbes, Adam Smith. They also read the words and speeches of Cicero, Ovid. Um, they read the his They also um, read the words of Aristotle, and they also read the history of uh, Livy. Now, Livy wrote um, the history of the Roman Republic. I happen to have a copy of of uh, all the books. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but I will one of these days. But, but yeah, Livy Livy had the history of the uh, of Rome. And um, it was very influential. So, okay, so they studied the ancient period all the way to the early modern area. That included late antiquity, that included the medieval period. And they looked to see how did just kings, did, did just kings trust the people with arms? Yes, the tyrants did not. The tyrants were known for taking the arms away from the people, disarming the people. Now that wasn't just in that time, it went on to this day, and we'll talk about that. There are perfect examples of, of nations in the last hundred years where they disarmed the people. Why? Because they wanted to be tyrants. And then what happened after they disarmed the people? They slaughtered them. I'll give you some examples. Okay, now, well, well, let's go into the examples right here. But um, what you know, all these people that they, all these people that um, that they read from, they impacted their views on natural rights, government, the separation of powers, standing armies, mercenaries, like I mentioned before, democracy. They were not fans of of pure democracy. They saw what happened in Greece. Pure democracy is not a good thing. It was Andrew Jackson who, who kind of pushed the whole pure democracy thing. The, um, you know, the founders wanted more of a republic, and, but that's, that's for another story. But also having an armed populace responsible for their own defense against criminals, raiders, invaders, and tyrants and despots. So, um, it gives you some examples of, uh, of kings or, or, or leaders or whoever that, that turned to tyranny and disarmed the people and, and in fact slaughtered the people. You know, Oliver Cromwell um, in the English Civil War overthrew uh, King Charles I, beheaded the guy. Well, you know, he slaughtered a lot of Irish, slaughtered a lot of the opposition. Um, Soviet Union, okay, so... You had, this, you had the uh, Russian Revolution, Soviet Union comes about, uh, Lenin led at the beginning, Stalin took over, and uh, Stalin slaughtered a lot of people. I mean, estimates at a minimum 20 million um, when he took the land from the Ukrainians, uh, when he felt like many of his generals were disloyal to him, he did, they called it the purge, and he slaughtered 20 million, that, that's an estimate. It could be higher than that. 20 million people. He disarmed them first. That's the only way to do it. Okay, Nazi Germany. You think Jews were allowed to uh, own guns? No, not during the, uh, not while uh, Hitler was in power. No, the Jews were disarmed. And look what happened to them. I mean, who could stand up, who could stand up against them? And the Nazis also disarmed the people wherever they went. The countries that, you know, they invaded numerous countries and they would, they would disarm the people wherever they went. The People's Republic of China. Now, there was something called the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was an attempt to see how loyal to 
Mao you could be. Millions of people slaughtered during the Cultural Revolution. Again, Red China, the people were disarmed. Okay, now the people also within Red China, you have Tibet, Hong Kong, Tiananmen Square. The people in Tiananmen Square, you'd remember that, 1989, they didn't have guns, they were slaughtered, a lot of them. Estimates were in the thousands, I don't have an exact figure, I don't even know if anyone does have an exact figure. Um, the, now, the Khmer Rouge, when they took over Cambodia in 1975, they slaughtered two million people. That was about a fourth, there, I think there were about seven or eight million people in that entire country. They slaughtered two million people. The people were unarmed. The only way that Pol Pot could slaughter his people, disarming them. Yeah, I know a lot of you are saying, ah, that can't happen here. Famous last words. Now, Rwanda. Now, Rwanda, they didn't even use guns. They used machetes. The Hutus slaughtered hundreds of thousands of the Tutsis. This was in 1994. They used machetes. Just, uh, just think about that. You know, it's one thing to be shot, but to be killed by a machete, not a good thing. Okay, now, the uh, Founding Fathers also knew about the French... I talked about them last night, uh, I'm sorry, last week, the, the Huguenots or the Huguenots, depending on who you're talking to. The French Huguenots were slaughtered, they were oppressed by the British, they were oppressed by the French. Uh, if you read the book, The Three Musketeers, uh, Cardinal Richelieu surrounded the city of La Rochelle. Why? Because those Huguenots were Protestant, and Cardinal Richelieu and now well, King Louis the Thirteenth. They were they were Catholic. Can't have Protestants. All right. So French Huguenots. Okay. Now we have had. We've had a lot of politicians. The one I think about the most is Chuck Schumer. I'm not a big fan of Chuck Schumer. Him and the rest of his people, the rest of his party, are, they will always say, well, you don't need such and such weapon for duck hunting. The Second Amendment was not written for duck hunting. Now, we mentioned last week and the week before that the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, was a restraint, a muzzle, on the federal government. When the Constitutional Convention took place in Philadelphia in 1787, there were a lot of people known as anti-federalists who did not want to surrender their autonomy to a strong central government. Their, their fear was, okay, we got rid of the uh, tyrant in London, King George III, now you're going to bring a tyrant over here to Philadelphia. No. We're happy the way we are. A lot of them like the Articles of Confederation and they wanted to kind of tweak them a bit. But they didn't want a central government dictating to these 13 different little countries, because that's what the colonies were when they became... They were, they were countries prior to uh, 1776. But when they became states, it was, the, the Confederacy, the Confederation was very loose. Philadelphia was not very strong, and a lot of the states did not want to give up their power. Now, each state had its own constitution. All of them did. Now, we'll discuss that because, you know, this is where the established churches came in. But the, um, the, about the Bill of Rights, we will, we will discuss that because there's a buddy of mine named Charlie Cowan. Charlie, if you're listening, uh, you brought something up, and I'm kind of glad you did because... Uh, it was something I was going to discuss anyway regarding the states and their Bill of Rights. So, when someone like Chuck Schumer or anyone else in the Senate or whoever, even if it's the President, sits there and tells you you don't need a firearm or you don't need a certain type of firearm, we'll protect you. You gotta be careful. We'll discuss the reasons because believe me, there's, there's quite a bit of them, but again, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights was for our protection against them. It was our state's protection against them. It was to muzzle and restrain the federal government. First in Philadelphia, then it went to New York, and then Washington, D.C. So, 
All right, now, another thing I wanted to mention real quick is, is that um, I have heard numerous people who side with Chuck Schumer, um, who are anti-Second Amendment, who are anti-gun, who will say only the police and only the military or the government should have firearms. The irony is, is that those same people are the same ones that are protesting against the police. They're saying that the police are abusive. They're saying that we need to defund the police. So it seems kind of silly that, and, and a lot of them don't like President Trump. So it seems kind of silly that they want to relinquish their natural rights to a police and to federal government that they don't trust. You tell me why they're doing it. I don't know, because it, to me it doesn't make doesn't make any sense. And you know, the funny thing is, is if you look at what's going on in Seattle, um, it's a very second, anti-Second Amendment crowd. Um, they hate walls, they hate guns, yet they're building walls and barriers, fences, and they're carrying around semi-automatic rifles. You doubt me? Take a look at the uh, news photos. So, okay, so now what we're going to do is we are going to take a look at a couple of other things um, in regards to the Second Amendment. Okay, so now, as we know that in uh, 1791, uh, December 15, 1791, the, the Bill of Rights was ratified. And now the, the question about, okay, does the Second Amendment state that you have to be in a militia, which, which they say is the National Guard, you have to have, be in a militia in order to carry a firearm that, you know, they say it's a collective right. Okay, well, let's take a look and see what the founders have to say. Because I'm going to tell you right now, and it was backed up by two major POTUS decisions. Um, uh, Heller versus DC was one of them. And the other one uh, was the, uh, yeah, that was the District of Columbia versus Heller in 2008. And then there was the ruling, if I can find it, uh, it uh, McDonald versus Chicago, 2010. Both of those state otherwise. Okay, but we'll, we'll all get to that. Okay, so the uh, James Madison wrote in Federalist, Federalist number 46, that he contrasted the, uh, the proposed American government to the European kingdoms, um, which he criticized because he said that many of those kingdoms are afraid to arm their people, whereas in the United States, it's going to be different. Here, we're going to trust the people, you know, to, uh, to, to own firearms. And, and here's another thing. It's not limited to muskets. A lot of people, we're going to go through all that. Okay. By the way, if you get a chance, get this Battle Weapons of the American Revolution. There's more than muskets in here. There's a lot of rifles but, and handguns, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, so yeah, there goes my pen. All right, now, Federalist number 46, you know, talks about the people being armed and how it, it's advantageous to the American people themselves that, you know, in, you know, we're in Britain, you know, you have the crown, they're armed. And they don't trust the people. Yeah, I know that, yeah, there was the English Bill of Rights, but, you know, we're just talking about, we're talking about, you know, uh, Europe in general. Now, the, the, the Redcoats did make attempts to disarm the people. That's what happened in Concord. Um, Lexington and Concord was because there was an attempt by General Thomas Gage to capture arms and munitions and powder in Concord, Massachusetts, and on their way there at Lexington, the first shots were fired. But... So that, that's something, yeah, you know, that's something that you will need to know about. So, okay, now, so we had the Second Amendment. Now, again, keep in mind that all the other states, they also had their Bill of Rights. They had their constitutions. Georgia did not have something regarding guns. But again, we're going to talk about that. So now, in 1822, Bliss versus Commonwealth. This is where the individual right comes into question. Uh, there was a guy in Kentucky, uh, there was a man, he was uh, indicted for carrying a sword concealed as a cane. He was convicted and fined for a hundred bucks. Well, he challenged it. The majority vote dissented, or the majority vote in the Supreme Court 
overturned the conviction, saying that, um, that, the, that the law to prevent this guy Bliss from, from carrying any kind of arms was unconstitutional. And so they voided the law. So, you know, the, uh, it, it, it says, this is one of the things that was mentioned, was the right of the citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. So that was their opinion when they got rid of, uh, when they overturned um, Bliss's uh, conviction. Okay, now, this one right here, this is another case where the individual right um, was, um, was affirmed, but it's, it's kind of a bad case. It was known as the Dred Scott case. Now, in the, in, in the Dred Scott case, uh, this one is Dred Scott versus Sanford of 1856. The Supreme Court, now this is what they said. They said that if we give, if, if we consider slaves American citizens, then we would have to give them arms. So they were not too keen on that. So it was a victory for gun rights. It was a defeat for civil rights, for, for humanity. But, but again, what I want you to read out of that was is that the Supreme Court knew that, that it was an individual right to own a firearm. And, and if they give slaves American citizenship, they will then have the right to carry and bear arms. So keep that in mind. Now, there were a lot of places, um, even, even in the even in, the, uh, in North America, that gun, gun control began to restrict black people, to restrict slaves. That's where, that's where a lot of the gun control came in. That was, gun control was mostly to prevent black people from owning firearms in those days. Now, new, uh, in New Spain, in the 16th century, the Spanish government prohibited free and enslaved blacks from owning arms, any type of arms. Um, they feared some type of, of a revolt. They feared that the free black men would side with the slaves. So blacks were restricted from owning firearms. Listen, this is a right for every American. That's why it's important that everybody, including you know, all the races, all the races in our country need to embrace the rights that we have and, and exercise them so that you're not, you can defend yourself and in the process defend your family. And then, you know, if you need to defend your country, you can do that. So, okay, so that, that, was, uh, that was New Spain. Now, French Louisiana, same thing. Now, they, they were also kind of fearful because of what happened in Haiti. Now, in Haiti, there was a revolution, a, a slave uprising, and after, after the blacks won, they slaughtered the white French population. So there was a fear that, you know, this is going to happen in Louisiana. Um, also, there was a revolt. Nat Turner, um, you may have read about Nat Turner. If you saw Roots, the original one in 1977, I remember they, they did talk about that. And I read about Nat Turner in college. Uh, Nat Turner led a revolt uh, in 1831, and that that sparked a lot of fear uh, among white Americans that there could be this big, big slave revolt. And so gun control laws were passed on free black Americans. Um, just, you know, take that in, understand what that means. So, okay, now in 1871, the National Rifle Association was founded. I am a member of the NRA. I have an NRA shirt. I advise everyone, join the NRA, join, here in Texas, we have the Texas State Rifle Association, um, Gun Owners of America. In terms of the violence, I'm going to address that because I understand about people complaining about violence. Um, one of the things that people like to say is that, you know, only in America we have all this gun violence. Yeah, that's not, not true. And, there are other places around the world where there is, there's, there's a lot more gun violence in, in terms of the percentages. But also keep in mind that in other countries, 
you know, like if you go to um, go to uh, London, you will see barriers put up against uh, against streets because people are using vehicles to run over people and then stab them. Um, stabbing fatalities in London are increasing because that's what people were using. Um, I read in the news somewhere that uh, that the crime rate in London had surpassed the crime rate in New York City. They didn't have guns, but they were using knives. You know, Timothy, T Timothy McVeigh didn't use a gun. He, he used the truck. He, you know, he used fertilizer. Um, in, uh, in Nice, France, uh, on one of the Bastille days, there was a man, um, a Muslim man, who got into a truck and ran over and killed, well, he killed about 80 people. 80 innocent people were run over by a truck. By a truck, 80 some people. So, you know, and, and there's a lot of car bombings in the Middle East. Uh, we mentioned Rwanda with the, uh, with the machetes. So if you have a sick mind who's hell-bent on killing people, if, if guns not available, they're going to use machetes, they're going to use knives, they're going to they're use trucks, they're going to use explosive car bombs. You know, in Israel, they, have, they were packing bombs on their body and, and then walking into uh, restaurants, uh, nightclubs, and blowing themselves up. Buses, same thing. So... Um, but, you know, there were some gun control laws that were enacted. Um, really, uh, first gun control was like around 1911 in, in New York. So, now, here's what I wanted to mention about my friend Charlie Cowan. Now, Charlie Cowan mentioned that in Georgia, uh, they did not allow handguns. Uh, and, and that is correct. In 1837, uh, because... Well, I don't know the reason, but Georgia decided, you know what, we're going to outlaw handguns and uh, knives for offensive or defensive purposes. That was the law of, of, of Georgia. Again, the Bill of Rights deals with the federal law, it leaves the states alone. The states were free to enact their own laws. Now, all the other states, they allowed people to, to, to carry firearms, to own firearms. Georgia did not. Now, it stayed that way, the uh, law of 1837, um, it stayed that way until there was a court case, and it was called Nunn versus State, N-U-N-N versus State of 1846. Um, what, what Georgia was stating, what, what, during the court case, the decision, they overturned the law that Georgia had where where they made it uh, illegal to own firearms, uh, I'm sorry, to, they made it illegal to own handguns and certain knives. Um, what they had decided was that it, it was challenged by the state Supreme Court in 1845. The court found that you know, there was no precedent within the state of Georgia, so they looked to the Supreme, they looked to the U.S. Constitution and they, they cited the Second Amendment of the Bill of Rights of the, of the Constitution to strike down the gun ban in Georgia. Um, now, this is, what, this is the information that I had read that I wanted to read to you, that in the, in the court case, um, it said something like, while the Georgia legislature could ban citizens from carrying concealed weapons, it could not ban openly carried weapons. To do so, stated the court, would violate the Second Amendment right to carry weapons for purposes of self-defense. And, and they go on. If you get a chance, read what went on. Again, it's called Nunn, N-U-N-N versus State, 1846. So Charlie Cowan, uh, yeah, you were right, but you forgot to mention that court case, which kind of overturned it. So uh, I hope you're watching. Um, if you're um, putting some kind of an opinion, uh, yeah, go right ahead. I don't care. <laughs> So, now, in, in that ruling also, the Nunn Court ruled that the Second Amendment guaranteed all people, not just members of the militia, the right to keep and bear arms, and that the type of arms carried was not restricted only to those born by the militia, but any type and any description. The right of the whole people, old and young, women and boys, and not militia only, 
to keep and bear arms of every description, and not merely such as are used by the militia, shall not be infringed, curtailed, or broken in on in the slightest degree. So the aftermath was is that that law was amended. It was it was removed. The uh, Georgia added their own little added their own Second Amendment, and you know. It, most states understood at that point not to even bother with any type of gun restrictions again until uh, 1911 when New York City enacted a law requiring gun owners to be licensed and it was only then that gun restrictions in the 20th century gun restrictions started coming out there were there were a couple of them that there were a couple of them that came out um, in the 30s um, you know you had the um, prohibition so, you know, you had like the Valentine's Day Massacre. So, you know, gun, certain types of guns were outlawed. Machine guns were outlawed. Um, you had a couple of laws, 34, 38. Um, and then in, in 1968, you also had new gun restrictions that came in because of the uh, assassinations of JFK's brother, Robert, and uh, Martin Luther King. But, you know, in, in a lot of that has to do with with the 14th Amendment, which we're not going to talk about. The 14th Amendment is, is um, where you incorporate the laws, the federal laws with the state laws, and it worked in a lot of things, not just in guns, gun rights, but also worked with, uh, with, with religion. But I'm, you know, I'm not here to talk about what happened with the 14th Amendment. What I want to talk about is, is the intent of the, framing of, the, of the founding fathers, the framers, the Constitution. When you see what they, when you see, you know, when I mention all those people, philosophers, statesmen, when, you, when you're influenced by those people and they're all, all supporting the right of the people to keep and bear arms, to form militias. Now, the militias, again, was they felt that a standing army was a threat to the people because the leader of the country, the king, the emperor, whoever, could use a standing army during peacetime, could use a standing army to suppress the people. So they were, they were very much, you know, suspicious of a standing army. They preferred militias. Who was the militia? Everybody. Everybody was the militia. 16 to 60, I believe, was the, uh, was the criteria. You had to be a male. Uh, unfortunately, there were a lot of them that said you had to be white. Um, I'm, I, uh, I haven't read all the laws that stated which ones uh, allowed black, black men to be in the militia, but unfortunately, that, that did happen. Um, you know, it, it's something that, you know, something that we're going to have to live with and something that we need to correct for the future in terms of just general behavior and how we all treat each other. Johnny Black, pretty good. Okay, so um, I think what we did, we, we, did, we discussed... Um, we discussed everything with 18, the 1837 case and, uh, you know, all the, different, all the different laws that took place. So we are done with that page. Now, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get all the information out here so that you yourself can, can uh, look at them, so that you don't have to take my word, so that you can just, you can for yourself take a look and see uh, what exactly is being said and... Watch it yourself. Okay, I'll read it yourself. Okay, now, the last thing. Some of the discussions. Again, we, you know, we discussed how there was suspicion about having a standing army in the peace, that militias were important to the, to the um, security of a free state. The militia was where the state... It was kind of like being a posse. You know, back then they didn't have police. Now, I was kind of surprised by that. But yeah, they didn't have police back in those days. Um, but, you know, you had posses and militias would drill in the town. So it was everybody from your town. Um, and it was important that it would be well regulated. Uh, the reason why is because, as we saw, let's say, with the Whiskey Rebellion. Now, the Whiskey Rebellion took place after... George Washington became president. It was after the Constitution. The Whiskey Rebellion, they called out the militia. George Washington was ahead of it. Read about the Whiskey Rebellion. Militias were used. 
Um, but it was, it was, each state had a body of armed men ready to take up arms. And unlike the National Guard where you left your arms at some depot, that's the National Guard. With the militia, you owned your own firearm, whether it's a musket, whether it's, uh, it's a rifle. And you know what? In, in, during the Revolutionary War, if you, you know, I, I mentioned this, battle weapons. During the Revolutionary Wars, there were, there were a lot of men who had weapons far better than what the Continental Army had. They had be better weapons than the U.S. Army. A lot of people will sit and say, well, you know, they didn't know. I mean, they didn't know that we were going to have these semi-automatic rifles. They knew about technology. They did not state that that the Second Amendment was, was about muskets. That, that's just a farce. You know, this book, which talks about all the weapons that we used in the Revolutionary War, you know, you have pistols in here. You have pistols, you have rifles. There's something called the Ferguson rifle, uh, Major Patrick Ferguson. Fantastic weapon. It had the British mass produce it, they may have won the Revolutionary War. But there were rifles that were far better than the muskets that the Continental Army had. So they knew about these rifles. And, you know, if you talked, if you went back in time and talked to Jefferson or talked to Madison, they did not want a, a U.S. military being so powerful that it could become a security to the people, to the nation later on. They really did not want a big standing army. You know, George Washington, when he left office, stated, stay out of the affairs of Europe. We, you know, when, when Britain and Napoleonic France or Revolutionary France went to war. You know, France was our ally. They helped us in the Revolutionary War. But George Washington and John Adams did not want to get entangled in the wars of Europe. So, just, you know, some, something to think about. Okay, so, now, so, if, if, if they had known that we had a U.S. military that had these weapons that were far better than the, what the civilians had. They would consider that a threat. So to use the argument that, well, they didn't know that you know, the people were gonna have these AR-15s. Well, they also didn't know that the uh, military were gonna have these types of weapons that could cause a, you know, that could be a threat to the freedom of, of the people of the United States. Um, would they have approved of firearms that, were, that civilians had were just as good as the military? Based on the writings, I'm going to say yes, because they, they wanted to limit the power of the federal government. They found it to be a threat. They wanted the states and the people to be able to take care of themselves and see to it that the federal government could never be a threat. Half the people right now don't care for the president that we have. In the previous eight years, a lot, I mean, half the country didn't like who, who was the president. I mean, they didn't like Obama. People don't like Trump. So, so if you were to talk to them based on their writings, based on the things they said, they would, I think they would, this is my opinion, um, purely conjecture, of course, I'm sure they'd say, hey, you want an AR-15, you go right ahead. Okay, now, there's the argument that, okay, the U.S. military is too powerful, that any rebellion is going to be in vain. Well, let's take a look at what has happened in the past. Um, I want to take a look at first where tyrants, tyrants attacked the people and then the people revolted. Um, if you looked at, say, uh, Romania in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, um, uh, Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife were slaughtered. I mean, they, they slaughtered thousands of people, the people revolted, and, you know, Romania fell. The communist Romania fell. Um, there were also some other insurrections. We'll, we'll talk about, let's talk about the fall of the Berlin Wall. Poland, Hungary, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and the Baltic States. The people revolted, and they rebelled, and there, they had had enough of communism, and there were just too many people. The Soviet Union could not have tackled an armed insurrection in all those places. They couldn't even tackle them while they were unarmed. So 
all those countries in East Europe, the communist governments fell, they became free. Now in Hungary in 1956, that wasn't the case. The people overthrew the communist government, but then the Soviet Union and the Warsaw, pa Warsaw Pact came and they invaded. Now, had the Hungarians been left alone, it could have become a free country. Czechoslovakia in 1968, same thing. Um, now, in the Soviet Union and in Russia from 91 to 93, there were uh, some rebellions uh, where the communists were trying to uh, either, either win back their power or take over. And I, I don't know if many of you will remember when Boris Yeltsin was standing on a tank in Moscow. When the people rise up, despots, despots cannot stay in power, but the people have to rise up. So, Syria. Now, Syria, um, uh, Bashar al-Assad very likely would have been overthrown had Russia not come in and helped out. Um, uh, the Syrian government lost a majority of its territory. Uh, much of it was to ISIS. Um, fortunately, ISIS has been obliterated, uh, at least in Syria and Iraq. But, uh, but had there been no foreign inter interference, uh, Bashar al-Assad very likely could have been overthrown. Uh, Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, out, killed. Uh, Iran, 1979, the people uh, rebelled and the Shah of Iran was overthrown. Uh, in Egypt, you had Mubarak. He was overthrown when the people rose up. Uh, same thing happened in, uh, in Tunisia. Um, in, uh, in Zaire, uh, Mobutu was overthrown. Uh, he had been in power since the 60s. Um, it's now known as the Congo. Uh, in the Philippines, if you remember Ferdinand and uh, Imelda Marcos, the people rose up and the Marcos authoritarian regime fell. Um, Palestine, 1947 to 1949. Now, I won't go into the details about that war, but what I will state is, is that when the, um, uh, the Haganah, the Israelis, the, the, the Jews, when they declared their independence, seven Arab armies invaded. Now, everybody thought Israel was going to be crushed, but they were able to, with the exception of the Jordanian um, army, they were able to push back all the armies, the seven armies. And, and they, they won that in, 19, in 1949 and, and they gained their, they were able to win their independence um, from Britain, uh, but also they were able to create their own little country. Uh, Cuba, uh, 1959, um, you had Batista, he was overthrown. If you saw the movie Godfather II, you'll remember that scene. Um, Nicaragua, you had Somoza, you know, the people rose up, 1979, the people rose up and they overthrew Somoza. Um, Somoza had a military. Uh, now, Communist China versus Nationalist China. Now, the reason why the Communists won was because the Soviet Union gave the Communists a lot of weaponry. The weaponry that they captured from the Japanese in Manchuria, they gave it to Mao Zedong and the Communists won. Afghanistan, 1980s. They took on the Soviet Union and they inflicted so much damage on the Soviets that they eventually withdrew. Soviets had an air force. The uh, Taliban, not the Taliban, but the Mujahideen did not. But, you know, we had, um, we had that guy, and I don't remember his name, we, they did the movie on him. Um, gave him Stinger missiles. They were able to shoot down helicopters and uh, and uh, the, the Air Force jets from the Soviets. A very good movie. Uh, Tom Hanks is in it, Julia Roberts. I can't remember the name of it for the life of me. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, France versus the Viet Minh. That was uh, one of the, the first French Indochina War. The French were surrounded in a town called Dien Bien Phu, and they surrendered. This is, you know, France was a major power, and they, they lost to the Viet Minh. Now, a few years later, they be, you know, the Viet Minh became North Vietnam, South Vietnam had to fight North Vietnam as well as the Viet Cong within their country. The people rose up and eventually. Now, can't happen here. Well, there was something called the Battle of Athens. Now, this happened here in the United States, in Athens, Tennessee, August 1st and August 2nd of 1946. If you get a chance, read it. You had the people. Now, a lot of these guys were... Um, World War II vets. They grabbed their M1 rifles and they fought 
the city government in Athens, Tennessee. Yeah, there was a gun battle. Um, no one was killed, but, you know, they even made a movie about it. But if you get a chance, read about it. The Battle of Athens, 1946, Athens, Tennessee. Oh, all right, so now, if you also get a chance, um, this book, it's a, it's a really good book. It's called The Second Amendment Primer. It has a lot of quotes from the Founding Fathers. Uh, it also shows the different constitutions of all the states. But, you know, it, it, you, have, you have Thomas Paine, you have Thomas Jefferson sitting and talking about, um, you know, no free man shall ever be debarred the use of arms. That's Thomas Jefferson. Patrick Henry, George Washington, John Adams, Samuel Adams, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, George Mason, a famous quote, to disarm the people is the best and most effective way to enslave them. It, it's in here, Richard Henry Lee. So many people, so many quotes from so many, like the John Locke and all these guys that I mentioned earlier. It's all in this book, the Second Amendment Primer. Federalist Papers also, I would say get that. And then the Battle Weapons of the American Revolution by George C. Newman. Get that. Okay, now, now I'm going to give you my commentary. I think I've given you enough information. So, I'm getting a nodding that, yes, I've probably been talking too much, but I'm going to give you a commentary. The right to keep and bear arms. I like to tell people, get your CHL. Learn how to use your firearm. It's your responsibility to defend yourself, to defend your family. I had a good friend of mine named Brenda who's supposed to be here. She was going to be a guest on the show. Her home was broken into today, her teen daughter woke up, heard a noise, she opens the door and there's a stranger in their home. Scared the crap out of her. The right to keep and bear arms. Women, a lot of women, sorry ladies, y'all, if a big guy comes and manhandles you, a gun is the great equalizer. John Adams said that for the Constitution to work, for the Republic to work, we need to be a moral people. Uh, they advised being a religious people, but you know that's you don't necessarily have to be religious. But we we need to be a moral people. Just because you own a gun, just because you carry a gun, doesn't mean you should use it because somebody pisses you off. You know, don't go into a situation being nasty to people, and then when the person gets mad at you and gets in your face, you all of a sudden say, "Hey, I feared for my life," and shoot the guy. It's not how it works. You know, when you get a CHL. They teach you that you use it, you use deadly force to get out of a situation or to stop a crime. But once the crime stops, you have to back away. But also, you know, again, this is my opinion. Don't go into a situation to start a fight and then state, oh, you know what? Um, I feared for my life. I had to use a firearm. If a guy cuts you off, just because you have a gun doesn't mean you should use the gun. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So I advise people, it's a God-given right. Use that right. You need that right. You need it to defend yourself, your family, your home, your country. You need to defend your country. And if, if we were all a good moral people who cared about each other, whatever your sexual orientation, whatever your race, whatever your creed, whatever your background, your nationality, color, I don't care. We're all God's children. We all need to take care of each other. We need to look out for each other. And, you know, just we need to be a good people. But we also, as uh, Pat Morita would say in The Karate Kid, just because you know how to fight doesn't mean that you should fight. You learn to fight karate so that you don't have to. Own a firearm, learn how to use it, and hopefully, God willing, you will never have to use it. But if you do need to use it for any reason, a criminal, a despotic government, self-defense in any case, you have it there with you. It's better to have and not need than need and not have. All right, I've rambled long enough. Time to end. It's almost 10 o'clock here in Houston. Uh, I thank you for being with me. I appreciate all that uh, your attention. I hope this was uh, information, very good information for you, and I hope I didn't bore you to death. Hope you had a good drink. Thank you for being on, thank you for being here. I might not be on 
next Tuesday because of work. But the following Tuesday, I'm going to have a special guest. And we're going to discuss race relations in the United States. And me and the son of a friend, he's like a nephew to me, because his, you know, his father is like a brother to me. We are going to discuss race relations, and we're going to present things from, from both sides. Those that are for, say, Black Lives Matter, and those who say All Lives Matter. Anyway, I'm Alan Joaquin with the Sons of History. I thank you for your time. Thank you for being here and watching this show. Um, again, might not see you next Tuesday, but we'll see you the following Tuesday, 10 o'clock Eastern, 9 p.m. Central. Thank you, and God bless.